Okay, so uh, today we're diving into the world of eco museums. Yeah. And wow, you've given me a lot to think about. Lots to unpack. Yeah, with all these different sources. We've got conference papers, like full a academic articles, even a YouTube video. It's interesting, right? You start to see how these sources, they all kind of point to the shift, you yeah. know, from thinking about heritage as like, something in a museum display case hmm. to something much more dynamic, something that like really shapes communities. Yeah, it's really like a whole new way of looking at it. Like you said, going beyond the glass cases and into these like vibrant communities. But before we get too far, let's maybe take a step back for anyone just joining us. When we say eco museum, what are we actually talking about? OK, so imagine this picture a museum, but it's like woven into the life of the community. It's not just objects behind ropes. Instead of that, think like bustling marketplaces, you know, right? where they're selling traditional crafts. I love that. Yeah. And like community gardens right next to historical landmarks or even old factories turned into art spaces. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's kind of the heart of the eco museum idea. It's almost like the community itself becomes the exhibit in a way. Right. And, you know, going through these sources, it's clear this approach to heritage. It's not just about preserving the past, is it? There's this really powerful social dimension, too. Like, one paper even calls eco-museums a form of insurgency. Yeah, strong word. It is. But it gets at something important, you know? Eco-museums can challenge how we usually think about who gets to control heritage. It's about giving a voice to marginalized communities, right? Yeah. Letting them tell their own stories on their own terms. Yeah, I mean, it's about shaping the present and the future almost as much as it's about preserving the past. And speaking of, you found examples of this all over the world, but I noticed Italy in particular seems to be like a real hub for this eco-museum movement. Oh, yeah. Italy's got a long history with eco-museums. There was one early one, the Eco Museo di Argenta, that was really interesting. It focuses on the Po Delta region. So you've got this unique mix of like the natural environment and cultural heritage all tied together. So cool. Yeah. And it's a great example of how these eco-museums can blend those two things, you know, the environmental conservation with preserving culture. And it's not just about looking back, and, right? Yeah. I mean, there are projects like the Eco Slow Road Destinations, where they're connecting eco museums with sustainable tourism and boosting the local economies. Absolutely. And those networks really show how eco museums can, you know, really make a difference economically, especially for rural communities, that they offer this different way of doing tourism, one that values authenticity, like that real local knowledge and sustainable practices all rolled into one. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what's really interesting about the Italian example is how these eco museums are like teaming up with other groups. They're working with Slow Food, universities, even UNESCO. Wow. Yeah. They're tapping into all these networks for expertise and resources they might not have otherwise. That's so smart. Yeah. It's really cool. And it highlights this crucial aspect of what makes a successful eco museum. It's all about collaboration, right? Building those connections between regular people, institutions, experts, you name it. It's about coming together to create something really impactful. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Right. And while Italy's got tons of these examples, there was one project uh, from Brazil that really stood out to me. It focuses on the Quilombola communities. Oh, wow. And these communities, they're descended from escaped slaves, and their eco-museum is dedicated to making sure their unique history isn't forgotten. And that's what's so powerful about this and really so many other eco museums. They give a platform to those voices that have been silenced for so long. It's about reclaiming those narratives that have been pushed aside and making sure those stories are heard. It really makes you stop and think, like, whose stories are we told and how does that shape our understanding of history? Mm -hmm. You know, it's about recognizing just how diverse human experiences are and how important it is to preserve all of them. Absolutely. And those stories aren't just stuck in the past either. They're woven into the fabric of those communities. They're living, breathing traditions. Right. So we see how eco museums go beyond the traditional museum in some really cool and innovative ways. But how does all this actually work in practice? What are some of the challenges and rewards of doing heritage this way with the community at the center of it all? Well, that's the amazing thing about eco museums, you know, they're really adaptable. It's not like there's a rule book saying this is how it has to be done. Instead, it's about figuring out what makes a community special, what's important to them, and then building from there. And you can really see that in just how many different kinds of projects there are. I mean, we've got everything from like a whole network of old textile mills in England telling the story of the Industrial Revolution to a repurposed silver mine in Mexico where they're sharing the iron stories, their families, you know, their whole lives. Mm -hmm. Each eco-museum really reflects 
something different, something unique about the place it comes from. Yeah, and they often shine a light on things that like traditional museums might miss. Like, you know that Eco Museum in Milan we were talking about, the one with the WWII what? bunkers? Oh, right, yeah. They've taken these hidden pieces of history, literally integrated them into the city, and now it's this incredibly powerful space, a place to reflect on a really intense part of their past. It reminds you that heritage, it's not just about big, famous events, right? It's the small stories, too, the personal ones, that make it all so real. And it makes me think of that project in Biella in Italy. The one with the woolworking tradition. Ah, the Eco Museo della Lana. That's a great example of what a community can do when they come together. They've got these 15 different cells, each one focusing on a different part of how wool is made, from the sheep to skilled artisans. It's amazing, right? And they've taken something that was fading away, this whole tradition, and they've made it relevant again. They're not just saving skills from being lost, but they're building this whole sense of pride, of identity for the next generation. That's it, yeah. It's about passing that knowledge down. And that's so central to the whole idea of an eco-museum. It's about making sure these traditions don't become like museum relics themselves. They need yeah. to stay alive to keep evolving or they'll lose their heart, you know? Absolutely. And it's fascinating how often that happens through actual hands-on experiences. It's not just about looking at stuff in a display case, but getting involved, taking a workshop, learning from people who've been carrying on these traditions for years. For sure. Like with that Veltorninch Eco Museum you mentioned, mm -hmm. they're working so hard to preserve the curateria, those oxen drivers. Yeah, the oxen drivers. It's not just about protecting the breed of oxen, but the whole way they're trained, the special harnesses, all of it. It's amazing to see how much goes into keeping something like that alive. It really shows you how connected everything is, right? Cultural heritage isn't just one thing. It's a whole system, a whole web of traditions and knowledge and skills. And eco-museums, they help you see those connections. Yeah. You start to understand that heritage isn't just a bunch of random pieces. It's all woven together. It really is. It's like this intricate tapestry. And just like a real tapestry, it needs constant care and often a good dose of creativity to keep it from falling apart, to keep it beautiful. And that makes me think about how eco-museums have to be really innovative in how they reach people, how they share their stories. Right. They can't just stay the same forever. They have to find new ways to get people excited, to spark their curiosity yeah. to make heritage meaningful right and we've seen some really creative approaches especially when it comes to storytelling definitely we're seeing eco museums experiment with everything from theatrical productions to modern art installations it's about pushing the boundaries of how we experience these narratives remember that italian eco museum that did paisaggi that theatrical walk where you experience the landscape through all your senses oh, yeah that one was really something else. It's such a great example of how eco-museums are using art to create these really immersive, unforgettable experiences. It's not just about passively looking at things anymore. It's about feeling, about really connecting with the story. And there was that other project that used contemporary art to bring these abandoned slate quarries back to life. Yeah. It really struck me how eco-museums can breathe new life into places as much as they can preserve traditions. It's true. And the way they talk about valorization of the territory, it's not just about remembering the past. It's about realizing the potential of these often overlooked places, their history and their beauty. It's pretty inspiring to see how much thought and creativity goes into making heritage relevant, to making it something that people actually want to engage with. Yeah. But all of this comes at a cost, right? Keeping things going, evolving. It takes resources, especially when it comes to funding. Yeah, that's the big question, isn't it? How do you make sure these eco-museums have the money they need to keep going, to keep doing all these amazing things without compromising what makes them special, their independence? Yeah, it's a tough spot to be in, right? Needing that financial security, but not wanting to lose that grassroots, community-driven spirit. Exactly. And you can see that playing out in how differently these eco-museums are funded. Some, they rely a lot on government grants, you know? public funding, mm -hmm. but others, they'd rather focus on what they can raise themselves within the community. So they're doing membership drives, looking for donations, relying on volunteers. And then there are those in-between ones, like where they use a bit of public funding, but also maybe make some money through ecotourism or selling local products. Right. It's like they're piecing it together, trying to find what works for them. Yeah. And I guess the key is to not put all your eggs in one basket, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you're depending too much on one thing, like government funding, what happens if that suddenly changes? 
Absolutely. You become really vulnerable to those kinds of shifts, whether it's policies changing or the economy taking a downturn. It can really jeopardize what you're trying to build for the community. It's a delicate balance, for sure. Mm -hmm. And it makes me think about that term that popped up in our research, that museumification mm -hmm. idea. Like, there's this worry that as eco-museums become more popular, more successful, they might end up getting absorbed into the larger museum system and lose what makes them special. It's a valid concern, definitely. The more recognition they get, the more funding starts flowing in, there's always that risk. They might start adopting all the same practices, trying to fit this mold, and then what happens to that grassroots authenticity? Right, it's like they become more about attracting tourists and less about serving the community they came from. Exactly, and that's where I think the whole collections versus living heritage debate comes in. Traditional museums are all about preserving objects, right? Yeah. Collecting and displaying. Mm. But eco-museums, they're different. It's about keeping traditions alive, celebrating the stories and knowledge that make a community what it is. So it's finding that sweet spot between honoring the past, but also mm -hmm. making sure heritage stays relevant, something that's still evolving in the present. Exactly. And that takes a lot of communication. The people running these eco-museums, they need to keep talking to the community, working with them, and yeah, even collaborating with institutions like those national museum systems. It's about figuring out how to support each other without losing sight of what really matters. And at the end of the day, it's bigger than just eco-museums, isn't it? It's about how we see ourselves, our communities, the stories we tell, and the legacy we're leaving behind. Couldn't have said it better myself. And you know, as we wrap up our little deep dive here, I think the biggest takeaway is, this is about all of us. It's about looking around our own communities and seeing the possibilities. Right, maybe there's an old building everyone's forgotten about, a tradition that's fading away, a story that needs to be told. It could be a community garden bringing people together, an artist sharing their skills, even just sitting down with your grandparents and recording their stories. Exactly. Heritage isn't some dusty old thing locked away in a museum. It's alive. It's all around us. And we can all play a part in keeping it that way. So what will your contribution be? What stories will you uncover? What connections will you make? That's what I hope you'll keep thinking about long after this is over. 